Chapter 16 Good evening, Mrs. Batterton, said Miss Jensen, her eyes shining with excitement behind her glasses. There will be a meeting tonight. The director himself is going to speak to us. He's a wonderful man. That's good, said Andy Peters as Miss Jensen moved away. I've been waiting to see this director. Tom said the director is very inspiring, said Hilary, but I don't really know what he meant. I'm sure he can't be that wonderful, said Peters with a smile. Oh, I'm so glad you're here, said Hilary. You're so nice and ordinary. I'm sorry, she said as Peters looked amused. That sounded rude. So, you like ordinary people, Peters said? Not someone who's a genius? Yes, said Hilary. And you, you've changed since you came here. You don't seem so bitter anymore. You don't hate. But immediately his face looked grim. That's not true, he said. I can still hate. There are some things that should be hated. The meeting took place after dinner in the large lecture room. Hilary sat next to Tom Betterton. From the way Miss Jensen had spoken about him, Hilary was disappointed when the director stepped up on the platform in front of them. He looked like a boring English businessman, heavy and middle-aged. First, I would like to welcome our new colleagues, began the director, before saying a few words about each of the new arrivals in French, German and English. After that, he went on to speak of the aims and beliefs of the unit. Though she tried, afterwards, Hilary couldn't really remember the director's exact words. Or perhaps the words themselves were just ordinary. But listening to the director speak those words was a very different experience. He spoke very simply about youth and about power how the future would be shaped by the young scientists, and how together they would create a new world. Here in this unit we are gathering the most intelligent young brains from all over the world, the director said. In time we will have the scientific knowledge and power to destroy the world. When that day comes... We will be in charge of world affairs. We will control the whole world. It was not the words themselves, but the power of the speaker that affected the listening audience so intensely. When Hilary left the lecture room, in a state of high emotion, she could see that the other people around her felt the same, inspired and uplifted. She felt almost drunk with the intense emotions that the director's words had produced. Then she felt a hand on her arm. Come up to the roof garden, said Andy Peters. We need some air. They went up in the lift without speaking and stepped out among the palm trees under the stars. Peters breathed in deeply. Yes, that's better. He shook Hillary's arm. Come on, Olive, he said. You don't really believe all that. We've heard it all before. But it would be wonderful, said Hillary with enthusiasm. It would be a wonderful world. Think about it properly, said Peter sharply. Youth and brains, what does it really mean? Here that means Helga Needheim, ruthless and arrogant, and Torkel Erickson, an impractical dreamer, or Dr. Barron, who would sell his grandmother to get money for his work, and your own husband, a man too frightened and nervous to work at all. And these people are going to rule the world? Don't make me laugh. It's all total nonsense. 
Hilary sat down. I do believe you're right, she said at last. But it was a wonderful idea. How does the director make everyone feel like that? I don't know how he does it, said Peters, but I'm glad you're back to normal now. Then suddenly his manner changed. I suppose I shouldn't have brought you straight up here. What will your husband say? He probably won't even notice, said Hilary. I'm sorry, Olive. It must be hard for you to see him like this. We must get out of here, said Hilary passionately. We must. We will, Peters said. I've made some progress. There are lots of people here who aren't happy. I'll get you out, Olive. And Tom, too. Peter's face darkened. Listen, Olive, it's best if Tom stays here. He'll be safer here than in the outside world. Safer? I don't know what you mean, said Hilary. Do you think he's going mad? No, said Peter's slowly. But a cage can be a safe place. Suddenly, Hilary remembered that Tom had said that the police were looking for him. But being in a real prison would still be better than staying here. Tom must come too, she insisted. All right. But I've warned you, said Peters bitterly. I wish I knew why you care so much for that man. Hilary stared at him. She said nothing, but she wanted to say, I don't care for him. He means nothing to me. She wanted to say, The man I care about is you. Have you been enjoying yourself with your American friend? Tom Betterton said as Hilary entered their bedroom. He looked at her closely as if seeing her for the first time. You're a good-looking woman, Olive, he said. From the beginning, Hilary had insisted that he should always call her by his wife's name. Once I would have noticed that. I'm a normal man, or I used to be. Hilary sat down beside him. What is the matter with you, Tom? I've told you. I can't think, he said. I can't work. The others don't seem to feel the same as you, said Hilary. It would help if you had a real friend here. I've seen a lot of Torquil Erickson lately, said Tom. He's a brilliant man. He's a strange man, said Hilary. I think he's frightening. Frightening Torquil? He's actually very gentle and like a child in some ways. Tom, said Hilary, don't get too friendly with Torquil Erickson. Why not? He stared at her. I don't know, Hilary said. It's just a feeling I have. Chapter 17 They must have left Africa, said Leblanc. I'm not so sure, said Jessop. Only a small plane could have used that army airfield. It would need to refuel before it crossed the sea. But I tell you, my friend, said Leblanc, we have searched everywhere, even if your agent has used the spray. If my agent has used the spray, said Jessop, we will know eventually. We just haven't found the right plane yet. He paused. I wonder, perhaps, instead of flying north, they flew back again and flew south. But where would they go? asked Leblanc. There are only the high Atlas Mountains, and after that, the desert. You promise, you promise that I will be able to go to America? Yes. 
I promise, Mohammed, if we get out of here, you'll be on your way. Tell me, why do you want to go to America? This country is not modern. I do not wish to stay here all my life. The brother of my wife has gone to America, so I have family there. Peters looked thoughtfully at the dignified, dark-skinned face. Mohammed in his white robes was an impressive sight. Of course, if we are found out... Mohammed smiled, showing his beautiful white teeth. Then it is death. For me, certainly, though perhaps not for you. Do you know what you have to do? Peters asked. I must take you up to the roof garden after dark. Also, I must put some clothing in your room, such as I and the other servants wear. Later, there will be other things. That's right. I had better go now. Somebody may notice we're staying a long time in the lift. There was dancing that evening. Andy Peters was dancing with Miss Jensen. He held her close to him and whispered in her ear. He winked at Hillary as he passed. Hillary tried not to smile and looked away. Then she frowned as she saw Tom Betterton talking to Torquil Erickson. Olive, will you dance with me? asked Simon Murchison. Yes, of course, Simon said Hilary, though she could see he was a bad dancer. I like your dress, Olive, Murchison said as they danced. They really do give you everything you need here. I know it can take time to get used to it, but after a while... You mean people can get used to anything? Well, some people are just better than others, said Murchison. Tom doesn't seem very happy, though. Is he here? Oh, yes, I see him. He's talking to Torquil. They're very friendly now. The dance ended and Hilary danced next with Andy Peters. I managed to get some information from Miss Jensen, he told her. There's a group of important people visiting here tomorrow. Andy. Do you think that might be a chance? No, I don't, said Peters. But we'll get to know what happens, the routine, and then next time I'll talk sweetly to Miss Jensen and see what else I can find out. What do the visitors know about this place? About us? The unit, I mean? Nothing at all. They're here to see the leper colony in the hospital. This place has been built into the mountain, so you can't see how big it really is. And our area is shut off from the main building. Our life here, it's still so unreal. I know, agreed Peters. I can't get used to not seeing any children about. And now you're here, you must be glad that you don't have children. They certainly wouldn't like to be indoors all the time. He felt Hillary's body suddenly grow tense. I'm sorry, have I said the wrong thing? He took her to sit down. I'm sorry, he said again. It's not your fault, said Hillary. I did have a child, and she died. That's all. You had a child? Peters stared, surprised. I thought you'd only been married to Bedderton for six months. Hillary's face reddened. Yes, of course, she said. But I was married before. Oh, I see. I didn't know that. It's strange to think that I don't really know anything about you. And I don't know anything about you, said Hilary, glad to change the subject. Tell me about your family. I was brought up in a very scientific household, said Peters. No one ever thought of anything but science. But I wasn't the clever one. 
That was the girl in the family. She was brilliant. A genius. She could have been as famous as Mary Curie. She... What happened to her? She was killed, he said abruptly. She must have been killed in the war, thought Hilary. You cared about her, she asked gently. More than I have ever cared about anybody. Peter shook his head quickly. Let's not talk about that. It was his turn to change the subject. Look at Erickson, he said. He's so formal. He looks as if he's made of wood. It's because he's so tall and thin. He's not that tall. He's actually about the same height as me. Five foot eleven or six foot. He looks taller, said Hilary. Height can be deceptive. Yes, agreed Peters. It's like descriptions on passports. Erickson's passport probably says, Height, six foot. Fair hair, blue eyes, nose, medium. From that description, you still wouldn't know what Torquil really looked like. What's the matter? Nothing. Hillary was staring across the room at Erickson. That was exactly how Jessup had described Boris Dleder. Was that why she had always felt nervous of Torquil Erickson? Turning abruptly to Peters, she said, I suppose he is Erickson. He couldn't be someone else. Peters looked at her in astonishment. I don't think so. Erickson is quite a well-known scientist. And who else could he be? It's not very likely. No, said Hilary. No, of course it isn't likely. Of course Erickson was not Boris Dlider. But why had Olive Betterton wanted to warn Tom about Boris? Was it because she knew that Boris Dlider was on his way to the unit? What if he was really Torquil Erickson? Just then, the deputy director stepped forward to make an announcement. Friends and colleagues, said Dr. Van Heidem, tomorrow you are asked to remain in the emergency area for 24 hours. Please meet at 11 a.m. I am sorry for the inconvenience. I must go and dance again with Miss Jensen, said Peters as the music restarted. I'll see if I can find out any more information. He moved away, leaving Hillary with her thoughts. Torquil Erickson? Boris Dlitter? At eleven the next morning, everyone met in the large lecture room, where a careful check was made to ensure they were all there. Then they went on a long walk through endless, twisting white corridors. Hilary knew that Peters had a small compass hidden in his hand and was calculating where they were going. It doesn't help now, he whispered, but it might help in the future. At the end of one corridor, they all stopped in front of a door while it was opened. Peters took out his cigarette case. No smoking, please, said Van Heidem sharply. You have been told that already. Sorry, sir, Peters paused with the cigarette case in his hand. Then they all went forward again, just like sheep, thought Hilary. The women will sleep in the room on the right, said Miss Jensen. The men will have the room on the left. The room where all the women were going to sleep looked rather like a hospital. It had beds all down each side of the room, separated by plastic curtains. There was also a bathroom, and the living room, which was shared with the men, was through a door at the end. Two films were shown during the day in the shared living room to help pass the time. In the evening, Peter sat next to Miss Jensen while Hilary played cards with Dr. Barron and Simon and Bianca Murchison. 
She enjoyed the game, and it was half past eleven when they finished. It's quite late now, said Hilary. I suppose the visitors have gone home. All day she had felt helpless, knowing that nearby there were people from the outside, but with no way of asking them for help. I don't really know, said Simon Murchison. Sometimes they stay the night, but they will be gone by lunchtime tomorrow. Is that when we go back to our apartments? Hilary asked. Yes, said Bianca Murchison. Everything here is so well arranged. She and Hilary got up and said good night. But just as Hilary was entering the women's bedroom, she felt a soft touch on her arm. She turned sharply to find one of the tall, dark skinned servants. Madame, you are to come. He said in French. Come? Come where? Please, follow me. She hesitated for a moment, then followed the man doubtfully through a door and along many white corridors. She had no idea where they were going. At the end of one corridor, the man pressed a button on the wall and a small lift appeared. They got in. Where are you taking me? Hilary asked. To the master, madame. It is a great honor. The lift stopped, and they walked down yet another corridor until they reached a door. When she walked through it, Hilary found herself inside a luxurious room, filled with comfortable sofas and beautiful rugs. She stared in astonishment. Sitting on a sofa, was a little old man with a yellow tinted face, Mr. Aristides. Chapter 18 Please sit down, dear madame, said Mr. Aristides. In a dream, Hilary sat down opposite the old man, who laughed at her surprise. So you did not expect to see me here, he said. No, indeed, said Hilary. I never thought. But already her surprise was beginning to fade. When she saw Mr. Aristides, the dream world in which she had been living for the last few weeks fell apart and broke. The unit had seemed so unreal because it was unreal. It was all a show. It had never been what it pretended to be. I understand now, said Hilary. This is all yours, isn't it? Yes, madame. And the director? He is very good, said Mr. Aristides. I pay him very well. He used to run religious meetings. He thoughtfully smoked his cigarette. As you know, madame, I am one of the richest men in the world. I wanted to use my wealth to help humanity. The hospital I have built here is researching a cure for leprosy. Even in these modern times, people have a fear of leprosy and will not come near a leper colony. It makes a very useful disguise. So that's why this place is a leper colony, said Hilary. Yes. We are also researching cancer and other diseases. Well-known doctors and other important people often come here to see and admire our work. But the secret part of the hospital cannot be seen even from a plane. And, of course, I would never be suspected, he smiled. No one would suspect me of anything because I am so very rich. But why? asked Hilary. I don't understand why. I am a businessman, said Mr. Aristides simply. I am also a collector. In the past, 
I have collected paintings, sculptures, and Chinese pottery. Now I collect brains. I am slowly collecting all the intelligent young scientists in the world and bringing them here. One day, every country will realize that all the scientists are old. All the young brains, the doctors, the chemists, the physicists, the surgeons are all here. So, if they want a scientist, they will have to come and buy them from me. You mean... Hillary stared at him. You mean that all this is just for money? Of course, nodded Mr. Aristides. Otherwise it would not make sense, would it? Hilary sighed deeply. No, she said slowly. It wouldn't make sense. She paused. But how do you get all these people to come here? I buy them, madame, just as I buy anything else. I buy them with money or with ideas and beliefs. If they have broken the law, I buy them by offering safety. That explains, said Hillary thoughtfully, why everyone here is so different. Hmm, as I thought, madame, you are intelligent. I had you brought to Fez, so I could take a look at you. I was pleased that you were coming here, continued Mr. Aristides. The scientists, they are not interesting to talk to. Their wives, too, are often dull. Indeed, wives are only allowed here if their husbands can't work properly without them. He paused. This seemed to be the case with your husband. Tom Betterton is a genius, but his work here has been very disappointing. But doesn't that happen all the time? asked Hilary. These people are in prison. How can they work properly if they aren't free? They are like birds in a cage, said Mr. Aristides. Eventually they will forget they were ever free. Then they will all obey. But if you sell scientists for money, argued Hillary, surely once they go back to the real world they can refuse to work for their new employer. They'll be free again, free to do exactly what they want. Yes, that is true, said the old man. But we are working on different ways to make people behave. We have been experimenting with a brain operation that will make people happy and content, but without any desire to be free. You've been experimenting, cried Hilary, on human beings. We experiment on people who did not obey, said Mr. Aristides. Such people have their uses. Hilary stared at him. She felt a deep horror of this smiling, yellow-faced little man who talked so casually about human life. He seemed so reasonable and so businesslike, which only made the horror worse. You talk of freedom, madame, the old man continued, and I know you are talking about your husband. I am disappointed in Tom Betterton, and his work has not improved since you arrived. So let him go, said Hilary. He won't tell anyone about this place, I promise. Perhaps, said Mr. Aristides thoughtfully, he would not talk if you stayed behind. As a hostage, would you do that, madame? Hilary stared past him into the shadows. Would she stay here so that Tom Betterton could go free? But Mr. Aristides didn't know that she wasn't Betterton's wife, that the woman he really loved was dead. She lifted her head. 
Yes, I would stay here, she said. You are brave, madame, and loyal and loving, said the old man. These are good qualities. We will talk about this another time. Oh, no, no, said Hilary suddenly, hiding her face in her hands. I can't bear it here. You must not mind so much, madame. The old man's voice was soothing. You are horrified by my plans, but when you have thought about them, you will gradually come to accept them. Never! cried Hilary. Never! Ah, oh, said Mr. Aristides, you speak with the passion that women with red hair so often have. You have beautiful red hair, as did my second wife. I have enjoyed talking to you. When I visit here next time, we will talk again. Please, let me leave this place, said Hilary desperately. Please. Mr. Aristides shook his head. I can't do that, he said gently. You would tell everyone about my plans. I won't, said Hilary. I promise I won't say a word, but I must get out of this prison. I don't believe that you would keep my secret, said Mr. Aristides. And you came here willingly to be with your husband. Here you have everything you need to live a pleasant life. He got up and touched Hilary gently on the shoulder. In a year or two, the red-haired bird will be happy in her cage, he said. Oh, perhaps not as interesting. Chapter 19 Hilary awoke suddenly the next night and sat up, listening. Tom, do you hear that? Yes, it's a plane flying low. It happens now and then. I wondered... She did not finish her sentence. Hilary lay awake thinking about her strange interview with Mr. Aristides. She had not told Tom about it. The old man liked her. Could she somehow use that to escape? A message! At last! said Leblanc with excitement. One of our pilots has been flying over the high Atlas Mountains, and he saw a signal being flashed in Morse code. He showed Jessop the message. C-O-G-L-E-P-R-O-S-I-E-S-L we can ignore the C-O-G and S-L, he said, crossing these letters out. There are codes. This is the real message. Leprosy. Leblanc looked at it doubtfully. What can that mean? Leprosy said Jessop. Are there any leper colonies in that area? Leblanc looked at a large map on the wall. Here, he pointed, is where the pilot was flying. Let me think. He paused for a few moments. Yes, I believe there is an important medical research hospital somewhere in this area. They are researching and treating leprosy there. But surely that can't be the place we want. It has an excellent reputation. The president of Morocco himself supports it. A clever idea, then, said Jessop. No one will expect that a respectable hospital is hiding the world's leading scientists. And only doctors are interested in a leper colony. No one else will want to visit it. Who owns and pays for the hospital? 
LeBlanc left the room and came back a few minutes later with an official-looking book in his hand. The money comes from a group of wealthy people, he said, but most of the money is supplied by charities run by Mr. Aristides. So, the hospital is paid for by Mr. Aristides, said Jessop thoughtfully. And he was in Fez at the same time as Olive Betterton. But my friend, this is unbelievable, exclaimed LeBlanc. Aristides is so rich, so powerful. He is involved in everything. Banks, factories, weapons, transport, everything. He sits in his castle in Spain and controls governments. Then it isn't really so surprising that Aristides is involved, said Jessop calmly. As you say, LeBlanc, he is a man of enormous power and influence. We were stupid not to think of him before. The question is, he added, what are we going to do about it? It won't be easy, said LeBlanc, calming down. And if we are wrong, oh, I don't dare think of it. Even if we are right, we still have to prove that we are right. And if we investigate, we could be told to stop by some powerful and important people. No, my friend, it won't be easy. He paused. But we will do it. Chapter 20 Several expensive cars arrived in front of the hospital's huge iron gates. Inside were a French minister, the American ambassador, a retired top British judge, and a journalist who worked for a very famous newspaper. LeBlanc and Jessop were also inside one of the cars. I hope, uh, said the French minister nervously, that we don't actually meet uh, the lepers. No, 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 said the ambassador. I'm told we'll be quite safe, and I believe the medical treatment of lepers here is very advanced. The huge gates opened, and the visitors were greeted by the deputy director, Dr. Van Heidem. Welcome, welcome, my friends, he said. As promised, Mr. Aristides himself has arrived from Spain, and he is waiting for you inside. Please, follow me. Mr. Aristides greeted his visitors in a large, comfortable lounge where they were served drinks by the dark-skinned servants dressed in white robes. This is a wonderful place, said the French minister, looking round. Yes, I am very proud of my hospital, said Mr. Aristides. It is my final gift to humanity. No expense has been spared. And we're doing very important work here added Van Heidem with enthusiasm. We are getting very good results in our treatment of leprosy and other diseases. A delicious meal was served to the visitors, who were hungry after their long journey to the hospital. They were given fine wines to drink and were feeling very contented when they began their tour of the hospital. The tour took two hours and was very thorough. The visitors were impressed with the expensive medical equipment, the well-qualified staff, and the endless white corridors. Some people asked detailed questions about living conditions and the people who worked there, which Van Heidem answered easily. Jessop and LeBlanc walked behind the others. We haven't found anything yet, whispered LeBlanc his voice worried. It has taken me weeks to arrange this visit. If we are wrong about this, we will lose our jobs. It's not over yet, said Jessop. Our friends are here, I'm sure of it. 
It's not really surprising that they are hard to find. But we need evidence, said Leblanc. If there is no evidence, nothing will be done. The French minister, the American ambassador, they don't believe us. They say that Aristides is above suspicion. Keep calm, Leblanc, replied his colleague. I do have some evidence that our friends are here. I'm carrying a very small machine that has detected signs of radioactivity, just as we planned. All these corridors are meant to confuse us, but there is part of the building that we have not seen. But you know it is there because you have detected signs of radioactivity? Exactly, said Jessop. It is just the same as when we found the pearls and the paint on the door of the car. This time we can't actually see anything, but the signs are there. But is that enough, my friend? asked Leblanc. Is that enough evidence to convince people who do not want to believe? Perhaps this evidence won't convince all of them, said Jessop, but I hope it will convince some of them. There's the journalist. He would love to have such a big story for his newspaper. And there's the man who used to be the top judge in Britain. He may be old, but he is still a man of great intelligence, and he won't ignore evidence. When the tour was over, the visitors were served more drinks in the lounge. The French minister congratulated Mr. Aristides on establishing such a fine hospital. And now, he said, it is time for us to leave. We have seen everything. He paused. And we are very impressed with the work you are doing here. Into the silence a voice suddenly spoke. I would like to ask a question, if I may, said Jessop. Of course, said Dr. Van Heidem. What would you like to know? We've met a lot of people who work here, said Jessop, but there's one person, a friend of mine, who I haven't seen. A friend of yours, Dr. Van Heidem said politely, surprised. Well, two friends, actually said Jessop. Tom and Olive Betterton, I believe they're both here. Can I talk to them before I go? Dr. Van Heidem's reactions were perfect. His eyes opened in wide and polite surprise. He frowned in a puzzled way. Betterton, Betterton, no, I'm afraid we have no one of that name here. There's an American too said Jessop. Andrew Peters, a nuclear chemist, I believe. He turned to the American ambassador. Am I right, sir? The ambassador looked at Jessop and took a long time to answer. Yes, you're right, he said at last. I would like to see Andrew Peters. Van Heiden still looked confused. Jessop looked quickly at Mr. Aristides. The old man's face showed nothing. You know the name of Thomas Betterton, don't you? Jessop asked Van Heidem. Just for a second, Van Heidem hesitated. He started to turn his head towards Mr. Aristides, but stopped himself in time. Thomas Betterton, he said. Why, yes, I think... He disappeared six months ago, said the journalist. It was front page news all over the world. The police have been looking for Betterton everywhere, and you say he's here? No, said Van Heidem sharply. You are mistaken. Betterton is not here. You have seen everything there is to see. Not everything, said Jessop quietly. We haven't seen a young man called Torquil Erickson or Dr. Barron. Ah, said Van Heidem. I understand now. 
You are talking about the people who were killed here in Morocco, in a plane crash. It was very sad. So I am wrong, said Jessop. You say these people are not here. <laughs> but how can they be, my dear sir, since they were all killed in this plane crash? All their bodies were found, I believe. The bodies, said Jessop, slowly and clearly, were too burned to be identified. There was a movement behind him. So the bodies of these people could not be properly identified, asked the retired British judge, Lord Alverstoke. No, my lord, said Jessop. And I have evidence that at least one person, Mrs. Betterton, survived the plane crash. Evidence? What evidence, Mr. Jessop? said Lord Alverstoke. Mrs. Betterton was wearing a necklace of pearls when she left Fez, explained Jessop. One of these pearls was found half a mile from where the plane crashed. How do you know? Th this pearl came from Mrs. Betterton's necklace. Because my colleague, Monsieur Leblanc, and I marked all the pearls, said Jessop. We believed that Mrs. Betterton was going to join her husband, Tom Betterton, who was wanted by the police. More pearls were found, and we also found a mark on a car carrying six people, which was made by one of the passengers with luminous paint. Very interesting, said Lord Alverstoke. Very interesting indeed. And where was this car last seen? asked Mr. Aristides, coming to life. At an old army airfield, sir. Jessop told them the exact location. That is hundreds of miles from here, said Mr. Aristides. Even if you are right, and the plane crash was faked, why do you think these people are here? One of our pilots saw a signal, said Jessop, saying that these people were at a leper colony. It is an interesting idea, said Mr. Aristides, but you are wrong, quite wrong. These people are not here. He spoke with calm authority. But you are welcome to search for them. I'd like to do that, said Jessop. We'll start our search in the fourth corridor from the second laboratory, turning to the left at the end. Dr. Van Heidem made a sudden surprised movement, and a glass crashed to the floor. Jessop smiled. It is an interesting idea. Mr. Aristides said again gently. He looked at his watch. But you will excuse me, gentlemen, if I suggest that you should leave now. You have a long drive back to the airport. Both Leblanc and Jessop realized that this was an important moment. Mr. Aristides was using his strong personality, daring them to accuse him openly. The minister just wanted to leave without doing anything, and though the others weren't sure, they hesitated to act against someone so rich and powerful as Mr. Aristides. And Jessop and Leblanc couldn't act without the support of someone in authority, someone important. I do not think, said a cold, clear voice into the silence, that we should leave just yet. It was Lord Alverstoke. There appear to be questions that need to be answered. But this is ridiculous, said Mr. Aristides. There is no evidence, no proof at all that these people are here. Yes, there is. Dr. Van Heidem turned round in surprise, and everyone stared at the Moroccan servant who had stepped forward. He was a tall man, with a dark face, and was wearing white robes, but he had spoken with a strong American accent. 
Andrew Peters, Tarquil Erickson, Tom and Olive Betterton, and Dr. Barron are all here. The man took a step towards the American ambassador. I know it's rather hard to recognize me at the moment, sir, he said, but I am Andrew Peters. Mr. Aristides made a faint, angry noise before sitting back in his chair. There was no expression on his face. There are many scientists hidden away here, said Peters. There's a whole secret area that you haven't seen. Goodness me, exclaimed the American ambassador. He looked closely at the man in front of him. Even now, Peters, I can hardly recognize you with that dark coloring on your face. What's your official FBI number? 813-47128, sir. And your initials? asked the ambassador. B-A-P-G, sir. The ambassador nodded. That is correct, he said. And you say, Peters, that there are many scientists living here? Yes, sir. Some are here willingly and some are not. In that case, said the minister, stepping forward, there must be a thorough investigation. Just a moment, please. Mr. Aristides raised a hand. It would seem that I have been very wrong to trust the people in charge here. He looked coldly at Dr. Van Heidem. I do not know exactly what you have been doing here, Van Heidem, but I obviously know nothing about it, nothing at all. There was authority in Mr. Aristides' voice. If you have been keeping scientists here, he continued, it is now over, and I'm sure I do not need to tell you, gentlemen, he turned to the visitors, that if anything has happened here that is against the law, it is nothing to do with me. Because of the wealth, power, and influence of the famous Mr. Aristides, he would not be arrested, thought Jessop. But he had been defeated, and his plan had failed. The minister turned to Van Heidem. I repeat, he said, that there must be a thorough investigation. Van Heidem's face was pale. Come this way, he said. I will show you everything. Chapter 21 I feel like I've woken up from a nightmare, sighed Hilary, stretching her arms above her head. They had arrived that morning at a hotel in Tangier and were now sitting outside on the terrace. Yes, it was a nightmare, agreed Tom Betterton, but it's over now. Jessop came along the terrace and sat down beside them. Where's Andy Peters? asked Hilary. He'll be here soon, said Jessop. He has something to do first. So Peters was one of your agents, said Hilary. He put luminous paint on that car and used his lead cigarette case to leave behind signs of radioactivity. I had no idea what he was doing. No, said Jessop. You were both. Very good at keeping secrets. And Peters isn't really one of my agents. He works for America. So, that's what you meant when you said I would have protection if I reached Tom. You meant Andy Peters. Jessop nodded. And I hope you're not disappointed, he said, that in the end you didn't die. Hilary shook her head in disbelief. Now I can't believe that I ever wanted to end my life, she said. I've been Olive Betterton so long that it's confusing to be Hilary Craven again. 
Ah, said Jessop, standing up. There's my friend, Leblanc. I must go and speak to him. He walked along the terrace, leaving Tom and Hilary alone. Will you do one more thing for me? asked Betterton quickly. Yes, of course. What is it? Hilary asked. Walk along the terrace with me, and then say that I've gone up to my room. Why, what are you... I'm leaving now, he said, while I still can. If I stay here, I'll be arrested. Hilary looked at him with surprise. She had forgotten Betterton's problems. But where will you go? Anywhere, he said. I've got money hidden away under a different name. So you did take money. Of course I took money. But they'll find you eventually. I don't think so. Don't you realize that my face is different after the plastic surgery? They have an old description of me. I'll be safe. Hilary looked at him doubtfully. Isn't it better to be arrested, she said. You won't stay in prison for long, but if you go now, you'll be hunted for the rest of your life. You don't understand, he said. You don't understand at all. Come on, let's go. Hilary walked with him slowly along the terrace. She didn't know what to do or what to say. Despite everything they'd shared, Tom Betterton was still a stranger to her. They arrived at a door to the road. I'll go out here, said Betterton. Goodbye. Good luck, said Hilary slowly. But as Betterton opened the door, two men stood there, blocking his way. Thomas Betterton, you are under arrest, said the first man, a police official. The second man moved behind Betterton to block his escape. Betterton laughed. There's only one problem, he said. I'm not Thomas Betterton. I've been calling myself Thomas Betterton, but I'm not really him. I met Betterton in Paris and took his place. Ask this lady if you don't believe me. He pointed to Hilary. She pretended to be my wife. Hilary nodded. But because I'm not Tom Betterton, he continued, I didn't know what his wife looked like. I thought she was Olive Betterton. So that's why you pretended to know me, exclaimed Hilary. Betterton laughed again. I'm not Tom Betterton he repeated. Look at any photo of him and you'll see I'm telling the truth. The second man stepped forward. It was Andy Peters, and when he spoke his voice was cold and hard. I know you don't look like your photo anymore, he said, but you are Tom Betterton, and I can prove it. He held Betterton's arm firmly and took off the man's jacket. If you are Tom Betterton, you have a scar in the shape of a Z in the bend of your right elbow. As he spoke, he ripped the shirt sleeve upwards. There it is, Peters said, pointing. There are two laboratory assistants in America who will swear that that scar belongs to Tom Betterton. I know about it because Elsa wrote and told me. Elsa? Betterton stared at him. He began to shake nervously. Elsa? What about Elsa? She is the reason you are being arrested, replied Peters. You are under arrest for murder, the police official said. The murder of your first wife, Elsa Betterton. Chapter 22 I'm so sorry, Olive, said Andy Peters. You must believe that. Because of you, I would have given Betterton another chance. I warned you that he would be safer if he stayed in the unit, even though I've come halfway across the world to make him pay for what he did to Elsa. 
I don't understand, said Hilary. Who are you? I thought you know, said Peters. My real name is Boris Andrei Pavlov Gleder. I'm Elsa's cousin from Poland. I went to university in America and became an American citizen called Andrew Peters. When the war began, I went back to Europe and helped Elsa and my uncle escape from Germany. Elsa, I told you about Elsa. She was a brilliant scientist. It was Elsa who really discovered Z.E. Fission. Tom Bedden was working as an assistant to my uncle, Dr. Mannheim, and he married Elsa on purpose because he realized how important her work was. When Elsa discovered Z.E. Fission, he poisoned her. Oh, no! No! No one suspected him then, said Peters. Bedden pretended to be heartbroken by Elsa's death and worked very hard. Then he announced that he had discovered Z.E. Fission. He got what he wanted, fame and importance. Then he came to England and worked at Harwell. I was uneasy about the last letter I had received from Elsa. Her illness and later her death seemed very mysterious. When I finally got back to America, I started asking questions, and I had medical tests done on her body, which proved that Elsa was poisoned. One of Bedden's friends, Walter Griffiths, heard about this and must have told Bedden when he visited him in England. Bedden became nervous, and when he was approached by Aristides' agent, a woman called Carol Speeder, he decided to disappear rather than be arrested for murder. He asked for plastic surgery to change his face. He was never a brilliant scientist. That's why he couldn't work properly at the unit. So you followed him? asked Hilary. Yes. I was so determined to find Betterton that I followed him to the unit. One of my scientist friends had also been approached by Carol Speeder. When I came to England, I pretended that I was disappointed with my life and that I wanted to share my scientific knowledge, and soon she approached me too. His face looked grim. Elsa was an important scientist and a beautiful and gentle woman. She was killed by the man she loved and trusted, who then took credit for her brilliant work. I see now, said Hilary. I understand. I wrote to you when I got to England said Peters, using my Polish name. I told you the facts. He looked at her. I suppose you didn't believe me. You never answered. Then I went to the British Secret Service. I didn't trust anyone, but eventually Jessup and I made a plan together. He paused. And now it's over. Bedden will be taken back to America, where he will go on trial for Elsa's murder. He stared down over the sunlit gardens towards the sea. And in the unit, he said slowly, I met you, Olive, and fell in love with you. But I'm the man responsible for sending your husband to prison and perhaps death. I know you'll never forgive me for that, but I wanted to tell you everything myself before I go. He stood up. Wait, said Hilary, stretching out her hand. Wait. There's something you don't know. I'm not Betterton's wife. Olive Betterton died in the plane crash, and Jessup 
asked me to take her place. Peter stared at her in astonishment. You're not Olive Bereton? No. I don't believe it, he said, sitting down heavily. Olive, my darling, don't call me Olive. My name's Hilary. Hilary Craven. Hilary? I'll have to get used to that. He put his hand over hers. At the other end of the terrace, Jessop and Leblanc were talking. I'm afraid, said the Frenchman, that we will not be able to arrest Aristides. No, said Jessop, looking over Leblanc's shoulder. He's too rich and powerful. But he's lost a lot of money. And he's old. He can't live forever. What are you looking at, my friend? Those two, said Jessop. I sent Hilary Craven on a journey to an unknown destination, but it seems that her journey's end is the usual one after all. As Shakespeare says, journey's end in lover's meeting.